Ted Chapman and this is the second video on the cell theory and in this video cast we're going to focus on how microscopic organisms were discovered. Now one of the scientists that you need to know for this part of the cell theory is a Dutchman named Antony van Leeuwenhoek. Excuse my pronunciation here, I'm not Dutch, but this guy built a microscope he lived from the 1632 to 1723, so kind of in the, um, the latter half or the, the um, middle of the 17th century, early into the 18th century. And he built a very simple microscope, and he used this microscope to examine pond water, blood, semen, and a bunch of other things. And he made some important discoveries. He discovered what we now know to be microorganisms, and we have named them today bacteria, algae, protozoans, and sperm cells. But that is not what Leeuwenhoek called them. Leeuwenhoek called them animalcules. All right, he called them animalcules because he had no idea what he was looking at. He said they were moving around like animals and they were very tiny like molecules. So he built a brand new word to describe what he saw, animalcules. Now, if you look closely at this picture, you can see Antoni here sitting at his desk and he is using his microscope. It's actually a handheld device. It's right here in his hand, and he is aiming it at the window, so the light from the window is coming in and passing through the sample and allowing him to see something that nobody else on the planet had seen. Here's a close-up of, of his actual microscope. This is from a museum collection, and if you look really closely right here, this is where you put a little drop of whatever it is you're looking at, and there's a tiny little glass lens right there embedded in this brass plate. And somehow or another, you use these knobs to focus, but I'm not quite sure how that works. So it's a very simple microscope. It can only magnify about um, maximum of about 100 times. It wasn't very clear, but he was able to see some pretty amazing things. All right. Um, Oh, wait a minute, let me go back here. So what was he able to see? He was able to see, and he discovered, all right, things you might recognize. He discovered sperm cells. That's a little frightening, okay? But he was the first person to see that there was something swimming around in the product that males produce that's been associated with pregnancy for a very long time, all right? He discovered pond creatures. Okay, microscopic pond creatures. You probably know these as algae and protozoans. Uh, if everything works out, we're going to look at some of these guys in lab. We're going to get out the microscopes and take a look at some pond water and see if we can see some protozoans. You'll definitely be able to see some algae. All right, but Lee Wenhook is credited with being the first person to actually observe microorganisms that live in pond water. He also saw um, single cells. He didn't know what they were, remember. He was calling them animalcules, which we now know were sperm cells in semen. He also found bacteria. He also discovered bacteria in just about everything he looked at, but especially in things that were decomposing, like spoiling broth and in um, um, souring milk. Uh, stuff like that, things that were going bad. He discovered what we now know to be bacteria, but he did not call them these things. He did not use the word bacteria or algae or protozoans. He called them animalcules. Remember that word. Very useful word when you're talking about um, early microscopes. <coughs> All right, the next scientist, which is kind of interesting because it was about, about the same time that Leeuwenhoek was working over in the Netherlands. Um, Robert Hooke was working in England, and I don't think they knew each other, and I don't think they really talked to each other. But Robert Hooke was a famous scientist in his own right. He did a lot of other, um, he wrote a lot of papers about a lot of different things, but he built a microscope that looks more like a traditional microscope. Okay, his microscope it has a eyepiece, so you would put your eye right here, and you look in through this, something that looks a lot like a telescope. Now, telescopes had been around for a long time. Galileo invented those. But you look through this eyepiece down at a lens system or some type of stage down here where you actually put your sample. And in order to make it bright enough to see, this, this whole situation right here, this is actually a mirror, all right? And what this, what this drawing is trying to show is that the mirror is reflecting or concentrating light from this whale oil lantern, and the light is being focused 
like a magnifying glass by the mirror onto the sample here so you can see it. Now you can probably imagine that this is going to cook whatever it is you're looking at eventually, or at least heat it up. So Robert Hooke was not able to really see anything alive. His, his situation just generated too much heat here. But he was able to look at slices of a very durable plant product called cork. Cork is actually the tree bark from a special kind of oak tree. Uh, it's like the corks you would put in a wine bottle or, or the cork that you might use to make a, a floor or a bulletin board. And he discovered that cork actually contains very tiny structures that were very regular. And to them, they, to him, to Robert Hooke, they looked a lot like jail cells or the cells that monks live in in a monastery. And he named them cells. Okay, here's a picture of Robert Hooke, and he gets credit for naming these very small structures in cork tissue as cells. So he used the word cells biologically for the first time. So we give him credit for coining a new meaning for this word. And this picture is actually a drawing from his, um, from his um, notebooks, which still survives after all this time. So these are the actual sketches that Robert Hooke made of what he saw when he sliced a piece of cork very thin. So what he actually was looking at is the cell walls of very old, very dead plant cells. All right, and to him, they look like tiny rooms, hence the name cells. Now, we're going to go back to the idea of spontaneous generation and the debate scientists were having over biogenesis versus spontaneous generation. All right, because we got to figure out where microbes come from. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you guys later.